What you have on your head is a portable device that allows to record the electric activity of your brain. And it's basically the possibility for all of us today to be able to monitor brain activity when, not so long ago, we could only do that in scientific labs or in hospitals. So um, actions are speaking louder than words. So if you allow me, I will switch you on. And uh, You're switching me on? Yes. Uh-oh. Uh-uh. And then we're going to try to see what is going on in your brain. But let's first, you know, it's a live experiment. Now, let's have a look at Dave's brain. So what you're seeing here is just the live recording of the electric activity in David's brain. And the different colors that are mapping onto this 3D representation of a brain represent the different waves that are activated why brain is listening, well, David is listening to what I say. I think um, in order to move further in what we want to talk about today, this portability, um, we're going to ask Yao to play another song and to see how David's brain is reacting to this new song. And this is the Swan by Camille Sansons. Thank you, Yao. Yao, my brain loved what you played. Thank you so much. <laughs> so what happened, Olivier? So we can monitor the brain activity of someone live virtually everywhere. And uh, what is really interesting is beyond the beautiful image of a brain that we shared with you, this 3D image, is the data that we can collect, the different brain waves that will inform us on your attention um, 
what your eyes are doing uh, sometimes. And again, we can know better what a person, not what a person is thinking, but how the person is reacting. But you can do a lot more. Actually, not only monitoring the brain, but you can act on things. And we can create brain-computer interfaces, making David even more powerful than he is. You can be a Jedi, for example. But let us have a look at something that happened very recently on a racetrack in Brazil. This is so cool. Last month, I, I went to this, to this speedway in Brazil, and I had this opportunity to, to drive a race car using my mind. The car, it doesn't have, doesn't have pedals, it doesn't have a, a, a steering wheel, it doesn't have anything. It's just him and his mind driving it forward. It blew my mind. It was very challenging to really concentrate and, and to, to feel that I, I was controlling the car. The team leader came to me and, and asked me, are you okay, Rodrigo, can we start? Suddenly it was me, the car, and the, and the track. I gave the, the first command, which was to accelerate, and the car started running. It was unbelievable. Pretty wild. Well, it's interesting because if we talk about that a couple of years ago, it could have sounded like science fiction. And this is happening with a device that is, that's the exact same device that was on your head, uh, Dave. And it cost the price of a gaming console. And this is one of the revolutions of wearable technology. And neurotechnology these days is the portability and the affordability of devices that, when compared in independent studies with clinical device, for a lot of tasks, provide excellent signal and allow us to move for forward. So the old devices cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Exactly. And well, you know, it's technology. Uh, our very first portable phones, cell phones, were very expensive. And the prices are dropping. The more you have users, the more market is opening. I don't know. My iPhone price keeps going up. But <laughs> the, uh, no, it's remarkable. And obviously, the amazing thing to me as a clinical person is I can start to actually quantify how people are thinking, quantify how they're responding to what I do. So when I treat a patient, it's not just, did the cancer get smaller? It's how did they feel? I may be able to measure that going forward. Yes, we can measure not only the individual, but we can collect the information on thousands of people and aggregate this information, not to compute average brain signal. That wouldn't make any sense. But we're able to see how patients could react to some treatment in um, mental disorders, for example. And this is brand new. The fact that we can scale and maybe reproduce and make evidence-informed decision-making when it comes to brain health. Probably a while if you had a quantitative measure of depression of you know, other psychiatric disorders, so you can titrate drugs, not just in a feedback loop of months how the patient feels, but almost instantaneously. Exactly, and when you look at the cost of brain-related disorders that was estimated to $2.5 trillion in 2010, and the estimate is that it could reach $6 trillion by 2030, this is huge. We need to be able to have new tools, new methodology that is portable, that is scalable, in order to address the cost of brain health that by 2030 will be superior to the combined cost of cancer, diabetes, and respiratory diseases. Are the pharmaceutical companies receptive to using this as a potential endpoint in trials? Absolutely. They are starting to see the benefits of being able to have measures not only of how some body parts of uh, the patients are reacting, but also how the brain signal is affected by the drugs. Uh, and don't get me wrong, it's not about being able to read the mind of a patient, but to be able to see whether patterns are evolving and how they can change based on what we give them and the drugs we're testing. Here, Olivia, obviously, you're remarkable. I mean, you've led health at the World Economic Forum. You're a, a world-renowned DJ. And you're working on these technologies to monitor the brain. I mean, you know, obviously, we should be monitoring you. Well, listen, <laughs> 
what I try to understand really is um, how we make decisions as individuals, as policymakers, as caregivers. And it's very interesting and disappointing sometimes to realize that the retail industry knows a lot more about us as patients than the medical world. Because they've been using technology, including neuroscience, eye tracking, facial emotion recognition, you name it, movement tracking, in order to be able to um, understand better how we behave as consumers, what is influencing our choices, why we are loyal to a brand or not. Think if we could scale this methodology in the medical world to address one of the key behavioral issues, which is adherence to treatment, compliance. That would be fantastic. Unfortunately, and this is my very biased opinion, I think the medical world is way too snob to acknowledge that retailers know more on a topic related hey. to humans than no, I the think, physicians. I think you may be right. Um, and certainly, thank you so much for giving us a glimpse at this remarkable technology. So we hear people like Elon Musk say, we're going to have machine-human interfaces soon. It's not science fiction. It's actually science. Exactly. And I think that when people like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk or talking about something that sounds like telepathy, mm, coming from someone who totally disrupted uh, the energy sector, space flights, the automotive industry, and someone, another person who connected to billion people on a social network, we can start to think that this might happen sooner uh, than later. And the consequences for our daily lives as individuals, but also as patients, in understanding how Things like meditation, mindfulness can help. There is already data on this to understand how we can deal with anxiety of a patient, pain, etc. Now we can measure more accurately how people will focus, relax, and the benefits are incredible at the human, financial, and societal levels. And the cello, you forgot that. And the cello the most beautiful instrument in my very biased opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Thanks. for your attention. It's been a pleasure.